plan from creation to send Jesus to be our rescue and that we accept it by faith. Let's stand together as we're called to worship. Please read responsibly with me. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By faith the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created for the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible, and without faith it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is, and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Abraham obeyed, when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land. For he was looking forward to the city that has its foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Come, let us worship.
Kelly to just come on over here and have a seat right over here so I can look right at you. We won't make you get up on display. I know the last two weeks have been kind of full for you. So I, I have a gift for each one of you. Um, I know that looks like it's parsley coming out. That's because it's parsley. <laughs> okay. Uh, and so uh, you'll notice that inside your special gift for today, uh, you're going to find several things. There is, uh, there is a K95 mask. I ordered it 18 months ago, and it just came in the mail. I don't need it anymore, so I thought I would give one to each of you as a gift. So there's a K95 mask in there. Uh, but I want you to, as you look at the K95 mask, just remember the, the last two years have been extraordinary years, all right? So that is a good, let's, let's be mindful of the past. There's some other things that are in your gift there. Um, there is a $50 gift card in there. It's a Visa card, and you may give that to your parents just to pay them back <laughs> for all, no. That's, that, that's a reminder that God is going to meet all the needs that you have. He has and he will meet all of your needs. You may not know where it's coming from, but that's in there. Uh, there's also a chocolate bar in there. It's a Godiva dark chocolate bar. Um, there are going to be sweet days that you can look forward to, right? There's going to be things that you can't wait to open. That's in there. Now, the, uh, the parsley is there because if you remember, uh, when we did the Passover Seder together, you take the parsley, and what do you dip the parsley in? Salt. That salt water to remind us of the tears, right? And whenever, whenever we celebrate Passover, or whenever uh, the people of God in Israel celebrated the Passover, they remembered that they had been for 400 years in slavery, and there were tears. Uh, and so that's in there just to remind you that life, sometimes the most meaningful moments aren't always the most beautiful. Sometimes they are treasured because we're not there anymore, right? Uh, there's a Mentos in there. That's just to keep it fresh. <laughs> All right, I think you should keep it fresh. Uh, there's some honey, uh, and I thought that was neat. I got you little honey packets because also in the Passover Seder, you remember not only did we act out uh, 
with the parsley and the salt water, but there was also a time where we dipped into the honey because the promises of God are really good and they really are for you and you have so much good to look forward to. Sorry. Okay. And uh, there's one other thing in each of them. You'll see there's a little blue ribbon and that's because in each one there's a compass that I ordered for you. Uh, you can use it if you go sailing. It works. <laughs> and it's a real compass, I thought, it's something that you'll just put in your purse or your car uh, because there are going to be times you're going to need to remember where true north is. And I'll give you a simple verse to remember that. Mark chapter 1, verse 1, the Gospel of Mark, probably written, of course, by Mark, but Mark was mentored by Peter. And so some have often called the Gospel of Mark Peter's uh, anonymous gospel. And it begins with verse 1. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's a good, succinct reminder of where true north is. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so, uh, let me give each of you your gifts. You'll notice uh, we have each of your names. Your name, young lady, is Timian Heidi Noel Becker. The name Timian means honor, it means value, it means special worth or a high price. We made up your name, Timian. But in Greek, the word Timian means honorable. And so I'd like for you to remember this verse, Hebrews 2.9, because in all of the Bible there's one place, I just told you this, she didn't know this till this week, but her name honorable. Timian in Greek appears only one place in all of the Bible with another word, kares, grace, which is her sister's name. And the two names appear together, Timian and kares in Greek, in Hebrews 2, 9. Because we see him, Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, he was crowned with glory and honor. And in the Greek, it's Timian. He was clothed with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that the grace of God, he, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. And I like that because both girls' names, Cadiz and Timian. Eli Fagioni. Eli means ascension in Hebrew. It was the name of the high priest of Israel who took young Samuel into his service and he mentored him. He gave him guidance when God spoke to him. It's also Eli Whitney's, uh, very famous, uh, 1765 to 1825, the inventor of the cotton gin. He was entrepreneurial and one of the wealthiest men in the Midwest. Eli, we expect a lot from you. <laughs> uh, the name Ascension, I thought about it in scripture. Deuteronomy 30, 12, the question was asked, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? That was Deuteronomy 30. The people of God said, who can ascend to heaven? Only Christ could for us. But then we know that David used the same word, ascend, when he wrote, where will I ever go from your spirit or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. No matter how high you ascend, we have someone who ascended higher for us. But Eli, your name is well fit for you to ascend. Emily Holston, we have known you for all 12 years that my daughter has been here, first grade all the way to 12th grade. You graduated together, got your names called out, right? Emily, your name means two things. It, it actually was never used in English uh, until recently. Uh, there's two meanings of the word. One of the meanings is the word to have a rival, and the other meaning is to work hard. It was unknown in English. In fact, there's no Emilys that we can find in the English language until the German House of Hanover came to the British throne in the 18th century. Uh, when they came, they brought their daughter, who was Princess Amelia 
Sophia was her name. She was born in 1711. She was King George II's daughter. And when she came from Hanover, Germany into England to be the first princess, her grandfather, King George I, was named king. Then her dad, King George II, she was the second daughter, so she didn't get to be the queen or the king. But she became one of the favorites of the people of England. And they called her not Princess Amelia, they called her Princess Emily because Amelia was German. And it was the first time they came up with the word Emily. You might know that Amelia Island is named for Princess Amelia Sophia. They called her Emily. Now, it was said about her one quote, Emily, that I think I'd like for you to remember. They said she was one of the oddest princesses ever. Quote. And they, the quote went on, one of the oddest princesses ever, ever to be known because she had her ears shut to flattery and her heart open to honesty. See, she hadn't grown up around royalty. She'd grown up in Germany. And when she was brought to England, she was one of the most down-to-earth princesses and one of the most loved princesses England ever had. I thought about two verses of scripture, one for the word rival, Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. I love that you and Timian have been friends since first grade. Not rivals as much as, as iron sharpens iron, right? But for hard work, Emily, the, uh, the word for hard work in scripture is perseverance. But the good news of the gospel is that it's not based on our perseverance. And so the verse I chose for you is 2 Thessalonians 1.4. May the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Because, Emily, you can entrust yourself to his endurance, his hard work, and not yours. Kelly? Your name is the anglicized version for the old Irish chelic. <laughs> C-A-E-L-L-A-C-H. Chelic, which is old Irish. Uh, it means bright-headed. It also means to see war or strife. Uh, it also, the Greek, uh, pardon me, the Irish word kirk or cell means church. Your name, Kelly, means church. But I thought about that chalic, that bright-headedness, and I thought about two words in Scripture, and I'll give these to you before we pray. First, first Samuel 14, 27. Jonathan was traveling. Jonathan was the son of the first king, King Saul. And Jonathan did not know that his dad had said, no one is to eat of any of the fruit of the trees. No one is to eat of any gave certain rules, and Jonathan didn't know about it. And here's the verse. Jonathan had not heard that his father had bound the people with an oath. So Jonathan reached out at the end of the staff that was in his hand. He dipped it into the honeycomb. And when he raised the honeycomb to his mouth, his eyes brightened. That's the word Kelly. That when he got the honey, it, it refreshed him. He had been tired, exhausted. He hadn't eaten. And that honey just brightened his life. Kelly, you do that. You did it at the coffee store. You did it at Chick-fil-A. You did it on the sailboat. That, Kelly, you have the ability to brighten the room when you walk in. You are that. And so I chose a second verse from Song of Songs, chapter 6 and verse 10, under the heading of Friends. Who is this that appears like the dawn, fair as the moon, bright as the sun? It's the word Kelly. Kelly. Majestic as the stars in procession. I'm grateful for each of you seniors, and our church is as well. We love you. Let's stand together as we pray for our seniors. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to have seen some of our covenant children grow, and now having graduated, Lord, we thank you for each one of them, for what their names mean. But more than that, we thank you for the hope that we have seeing them, knowing that you are at work in their lives. 
I pray your blessing on them. I pray that you would show them your face, that you would give them your countenance, that your blessing would be on them, that they would leave this milestone of their life of graduating, and they would remember that they've been loved and cared for, and there are so many good things stored up for them. May they constantly pull out that greatest true north, which is your word of God, and may they follow you all the days of their life. We all join our prayers for their blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as they return to their seats and we sing, Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision. Turn these tithes and offerings to you. We are thankful for your provision to this, your church. We pray for our missionaries, our partners around the world. I pray that you would meet every need that they have, that you would open doors for the gospel to be shared. Thank you that you still publish the word of God, that you still send people around the world and even across the street. We pray that you would meet the needs of our congregation for this church. Lord, thank you that the generosity that we experienced began with your generosity to us. May we live responsively to that, giving back to you your tithes and our offerings. We do it in Jesus' name as an act of worship, an act of embracing your lordship, that you are our God and our King. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh God, before the mountains were brought forth, or days of spring and summer filled the earth, from everlasting, you are God. We 
dwell beneath the stars in ancient skies. A thousand years are nothing in your sight from everlasting you are God and all our days are held within your hands your perfect love and favor have no end we rest within the wisdom of your plan everlasting God. Oh God, when joy and tragedy collide and loss reminds us life is but a sigh from everlasting you are God. Your perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within the wisdom of your plan, everlasting God. Oh God of light, our are known to you, but by your grace you're making all things new. So satisfy us in our numbered days, establish every effort while we wait from everlasting. Perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within the wisdom of your plan, everlasting. And all our days are held within your hands. Your perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within the of your plan everlasting God. Friends, before we knew that we even needed salvation, God had provided for us a favor. The joy that coming to him to find it already done
the grace of God has reached for me and pulled me from the raging sea and I am safe on this solid ground the Lord is my salvation I will not fear when darkness falls his strength will help me scale these walls I'll see the sun of the rising sun the Lord is my salvation who is like the Lord our God strong to save faithful in love my dead is paid and the victory won the Lord is my salvation is hidden in the Lord. He flowers each promise of his word. When winter fades, I know spring will come. The Lord is my salvation. In times of waiting, times of His grace will renew these days. The Lord is my salvation. my final day he will not leave me in the grave but I will rise he will call me is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation this is my God and I will praise him my father's God I will exalt him the peace of the Lord be with you all let's take a few minutes and greet those around us welcome this morning to Concord Prez
so normally, uh, at a senior graduation moment, you give them a Bible, right? Uh, one of the reasons that I gave them the $50 instead of the Bible is because uh, most people now, hey, use the $50 and download a Bible onto your phone so that you've got it with you all the time. I use my phone all the time uh, because of, uh, in fact, I almost did that for you as I bought all of you the ESV Study Bible online, but it's $39. It's a great choice. It's the one I would commend to you because I do know that a lot of people uh, read their electronics more than they read books, but I want to make sure that uh, you know that we really, all, all the truth that we all the truth that we can know for certain comes from the scriptures. And there's no better source. Uh, that being said, there were some other applications that came up. Tony came up to me afterwards and said, you should have mentioned that they need to look at the coffee mug. And when you dump everything out and it's empty, what was the point of that? <laughs> then, you, all right, then you get filled up with Christ. With, not with all this other stuff. It's fill it up with Christ. And then I said, yes, and another one. Uh, you'll notice each of the coffee mugs say Concord on them, uh, but they're printed imperfectly. In fact, it was so imperfect that we decided not to use them to give out to guests because they're printed imperfectly. It just kind of reminds you, you know, it's okay. We're all jars of clay, <laughs> jars of clay. So enjoy your gift. Uh, we do have another 97 of the imprinted cups, and if you'd like one, <laughs> They are $100 a piece because I understand if something is printed imperfectly, it's more valuable. So uh, those will be available uh, in the stewardship section of our website. You can also see me after service. So open to Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through, 1 through 13. For those of you that studied with me on Wednesday, nothing you hear will be connected to anything we studied on Wednesday. I changed the sermon. Um, based on the commendation that I heard yesterday at graduation, uh, I, I feel like we need to get a more direct commendation for not only our graduates, but encouragements to us. So that means we'll just be stuck in Romans 15 at least one week longer. Uh, but let's read the text, Romans 15, 1 through 13. Let's follow along together as we read. This is God's inerrant word. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. This is kind of in your mind. Keep those words in your mind. That we might have hope. Verse 5. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs and in order that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, therefore I will praise you among the Gentiles and sing your name. And again it is said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and, all, and let all the peoples extol him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace 
in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. All men are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. I want to answer one question today, and it really is in light of what I heard yesterday. I had a wonderful opportunity to go to graduation yesterday, heard a salutatorian address, a valedictorian address, a superintendent's address. Uh, that was all wonderful and exciting, but I want, to, I, want to add, I want to give some substance that matters today. I want to answer the question, how does God produce hope in us? How does God produce hope in us? And I, I want to notice, particularly from verses 9 through 13, how God produces hope. And then, uh, when we come back to this text, and, I'm, and I'll be teaching the next part, we're going to go back and cover verses 1 through 8, and even apply that to what I'm saying today. But I want us to centrally notice that the theme here is he's giving us a description of the way that God produces hope in our lives. And the reason I bring that up is because I got to tell you, do you remember where you were on graduation day sitting there with the mortarboard on your head? And you might, you didn't know what was ahead. You didn't know what was coming. You didn't know what your marriage would be like. You didn't know what your kids would be like. You didn't know what your health would be like, right? How is it that we can look forward with hope to the future? I want to give that to you. I want to show you what the Word of God says. Because when we leave here today, I want to leave with a greater confidence of His hope in us. Because I did not leave that graduation ceremony with that feeling. I left with a, you can pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, you can work hard, and you can do anything you want. I remember when I heard that in eighth grade, and they looked at me and said, you can do anything you want. You want to, be, you want to play in the NBA? If you work hard enough, and I'm, I'm thinking, really? I could play in the NBA. <laughs> now, I knew I hadn't finished growing quite yet in eighth grade. I thought, well, I might grow past 5'4". You don't know. Maybe. Maybe I will be the next Spud Webb. I don't know. But the truth is, if you put your hope in your abilities, if you put your hope in your skill set, if you put your hope in your, your, your creativity, then your hope is going to let you down. Where do we get hope from that is persevering? From the text, I'm going to give you six ideas. Number one, the first and most fundamental is this, that God himself is identified as the God of hope. Notice that with me. Look at verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Notice, number one, if all you get is that point, everything starts with God. That God identifies himself, I am the God of hope. If there is hope for joy that is deep and eternal, it will be a hope that is founded on God. And let me just say, the alternate is also true, that all other foundations fail. Right? So God is, God is a God of hope, and this we must believe. We were called to worship today from Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. If you look at your call to worship, you can think about it. I'm going I'm to read it to you. Whoever would draw near to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. In other words, we begin by, re by realizing and believing that not only does God exist, but that he exists in particular in our text as the God of of hope. That's the first and most fundamental step towards hope. God. All right? So parents, the four seniors that we just saw up here and all that we dream and hope for them, it begins with our hope is not even in them. Our hope is in God. That he and his faithfulness and his endurance. 
even when I was looking, when I was looking at Emily and thinking about perseverance, I'm not going to add to her anything that God hasn't added. I'm not going to say to her, and now you need to persevere because your name means hard working. No, the hope of the gospel is that God causes you to persevere. Okay, that's number one. Number two. If number one is that God has identified himself as the God of hope, I want you to notice secondly from our text that the God of hope speaks words of promise over you. Notice how Paul words it. He says in verse 13, the God of hope, but verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, he quotes four passages from the Old Testament. What he is doing is he is speaking over you and identifying that God is a God who makes promises over you. He recites promises. Look at them with me. Uh, he says... In verse 9, and here he's quoting from Psalm 1849. He says, therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. That's quote number 1 from Psalm 1849. He then quotes Deuteronomy 32, verse 43. Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. And then in verse 11, he quotes Psalm 117, verse 1. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. You can tell he was... Uh, a translator from the north, if he was a translator from the south, he would have said, praise the Lord, all y'all Gentiles. But he was from the north, and all you Gentiles, right? And let the people extol him. That's a third promise. And then look at the fourth promise in verse 12 of our text. This is from Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 10. The root of Jesse will come. Even he who arises to rule the Gentiles. In him will the Gentiles hope. When Isaiah gave that promise, he gave that promise in the context of a people who had been taken from their land, were living in Babylon. They were not ruling themselves. The cruel hand of the oppressor was hard on them, and they wondered if God would ever set them free. And Isaiah says to them, the root of Jesse will come. Friends, the God of hope speaks words of promise. And what's remarkable about all four of those Bible quotes, right, is that the only one that's an explicit promise is the last one. Look at verse 12 with me. Uh, and if you want to underline it, I'm going to emphasize it. I'm going to put the emphasis on particular syllables, okay? Okay. He says in verse 12, the root of Jesse will come. And in my Bible, I just underlined that, will. He does arise to rule Gentiles, and in him will the Gentiles hope. Do you see that promise? Sometimes we need to be reminded that he is the God of promise. Secondly, that he speaks promises over us. The two middle quotes that he gives us in verses 10 and 11 aren't as much promises, really, as they are commands or exhortations. Why is that important? Uh, look at it with me. Rejoice with God's people, praise the Lord, extol him. He's commanding us to do these things. And in verse 9, it's really more a testimony than a command or a promise. He says, I will praise you among the Gentiles. But Paul, he quotes all four. He quotes the testimony, he quotes the commands, and he quotes the promise. He gives all four of these as divine words that all give hope. Evidently. Once Paul knows the big picture of what God is going to do in history, namely, he will be folding the Gentiles into the covenant people. He sees hope for the Gentiles wherever God witnesses to them or woos them. But the most important thing to see here is that Paul is quoting Scripture. When he's on his way to pray for the abounding hope of the church, he proceeds with a prayer with God's word of promise. And I don't want us to miss that. We don't get our promises based on, oh, I have a feeling or the Lord told me and I'm holding on to this. No, we get the confidence from his word, period. Oh, oh. It is absolutely essential 
and, and we won't be able to get to step four if we don't get that settled. So step one is the God of hope. Step two is God's word of promise. This entire book commands testimonies and promises all amount to the promise of God. Does that make sense? Okay, number three. The third step. The third step of how God produces hope in us, according to the text, is in verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that, and he answers it, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. The third step is the spirit of power. The Holy Spirit. God's spirit. Hope that is based on Christ and has the glory of God for its hoped for treasure is not the product of unaided human will. What I heard yesterday was, and I'm grateful for Navarre High School, I'm grateful for whatever schools you went and cheered on, whether they were homeschool or Christian school or private school. If our hope is in our efforts, if our hope is in our will, even if it is aided will, we are in trouble. But I want you to notice, it is by the Holy Spirit, not us. And if you hope in Christ today, if you hope in Christ and not in money, if in Christ today and not in health, in Christ today and not in friends, Christ today and not in your feelings of joy, in Christ today and not in government, then that hope is the work of the Holy Spirit. By nature, our will is at enmity with God. We are depraved. And the essence of our depravity is really seen in our self-exalting, our self-reliance, our self-determination. And friends, that's what our graduates will hear at every graduation speech except for this one which says, if you are dependent on yourself, you will fail. But if you come to the God of hope and you see that he has been speaking over you promises of hope from his word and if you see that it is a product and an act of the Holy Spirit, we then learn that the glory of God is gonna be our highest hope for treasure. And if we're going to hope on the basis of Christ's righteousness and not ours, we must literally be born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 6, and 7, earlier we've studied this. It says literally, the mind of the flesh is death, but the mind of the spirit is life and peace. For the mind of the flesh is hostile to God. In other words, the way we are by nature, by our flesh, is hostile to God. But what changes that is the Holy Spirit. He subdues our hostility. Paul says it another way in 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 that the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. He's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. He said it in Ephesians 2, 5, for we were dead in our trespasses, dead in our sins. And so, number one, the God of hope. Number two, the word of promise. Number three, the Spirit is the power. How does he give us hope? Those are the first three steps. And they are all, I will say, objective, objectively realities contrary to the way we live. They are not our experience. God, word, and the spirit exist whether we do or not. They pre-exist us, they are beyond us, and they are dependable. In fact, they do not depend on us. Pause just for a minute. I had to be reminded of that this morning. Just a personal illustration. I woke up today the latest I have ever woken up on a Sunday morning. I know this because the sun was shining in my room and my wife leaned over and said, it's Sunday, what are you doing? <laughs> I jumped out of bed, is it really Sunday, right? Yes, it's really Sunday. And I had to remind myself driving to church that God is not dependent upon me in any way. Isn't that great to be reminded of? That these first three ideas are complete. It is, he is the God of hope. His word 
is where we find it out. And it is his Holy Spirit that's going to make it happen. So we can be at ease. Now, these next steps do occur in us. Number, qu- number four, and quickly, faith. Faith. I put it that simply because that's how simply Paul puts it. Look at verse 13 again. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. But look at those two words, in believing. He, that's simply the word pistuo, in, be, in having faith. The God of hope works joy and peace leading to abounding hope as we are putting our faith in Christ as we're believing. So here's the key question. How does the Holy Spirit, how does the power of the Holy Spirit connect us to the word of promise so that it produces joy and peace and hope? The Holy Spirit does it by creating faith in you. When you were pre-alive to God, when you were not alive to God, you were dead and unable to respond. And what God does through the power of the Holy Spirit is he makes us able to live and believe. By God's grace, in some way, our spiritually dead heart is presented with the word of promise, the gospel of Christ. And the first time that we hear it, sometimes nothing happens. We hear about the promise and we go, yeah, I've heard that before, or maybe nothing happened. But for those of you that are alive to God, you remember If the Holy Spirit comes and gives you new birth, new life, new spiritual perception, and he does that in our heart, suddenly we see Christ as the word of promise for who he really is. And when our born-again heart sees Jesus for who he really is, our faith receives him. Our faith embraces him. Our faith is close to him. Our faith links with him. Our faith unites with him. And this link or union with Christ, the old term, the theological term for this link, this connection is called union with Christ. That that union, that conduit, that channel, that connection through which the joy-giving, peace-giving, hope, giving power of the promises of God comes to us. If you are here today and you are lacking in hope, those first three things have already been done on your behalf. They're not dependent upon you. He then gives you the ability. He wakes you up so that you might have faith. The root of Jesse will come. Yes! (laughs) Praise God, my king has come. And he arises to rule the Gentiles. We say, yes, my king rules over all the nations. And in him will the Gentiles hope. Yes, I will hope in him. He is my savior, my Lord, and my God. That is the work of the Holy Spirit, awakening faith in us. It is believing something we could not believe until God put it in us. That's number four, faith. Number five, and quickly, right? Here it is. Step five, I've already mentioned it. And that is the awakening after faith, right? We have an awakening in our hearts of joy and peace. Look at verse 13 carefully. He says, may the God of hope fill you with... Notice the word right before the word joy. What's that? (laughs) May the God of hope fill you with all joy. And peace in believing. Right? I want you to notice that joy and peace flow from the word of promise. Through the connection of faith by the power of the Holy Spirit into the soul of the believer. Which leads finally to the final step, number six. You've got this joy and peace Step six is abounding in hope. We have faith, right? We have awakening of joy and peace. And step six is abounding in hope. That's that last phrase of verse 13. 
that you may abound in hope. The reason I say this is a surprise is that surely hope is what prompted joy and peace, we think, right? Hope is what prompted joy and peace. Surely when we saw the word of promise, it awakened in us coming from the God of hope, right? It awakens in us hope. And hope gave rise to joy and peace. But now, Paul ends by saying, no, it's not that way at all. It's not that hope creates joy and peace. It's that joy and peace create hope. I found that contradictory. I found that a challenge. I thought I hope in order that I might have joy and peace. No, God is filling you with joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope. Here's the simple point. The fullness of hope never reaches a limit in this life. The fullness of hope never reaches a limit here because there will always be something you're still hoping for, longing for. It can always grow. It can always abound more and more. Think about Paul. In all that he experienced in his own salvation, in his own awakening from death into life, right? And what did he say? I find it a struggle to still stay here. <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be in heaven. And I've even prayed, Lord, let me come. And God has said, no. God has said to Paul, I want you to stay for two reasons. I want you to stay because you're going to be a benefit to those around you. And you're going to live for my glory. Paul still had some things to hope for. What do we hope for in heaven? Friends, I, Every time someone passes away that I've known, heaven gets a little sweeter, right? Because you know someone's there. But the longer we live and the more we understand what the gospel is, doesn't our expectation of who we see in heaven change? That maybe the first person we don't want to see wasn't grandma when, you know, that was our first goal. Now, all of a sudden, we do want to see the one who died for us. We cannot wait to see him face to face, that one for whom we have never seen, that one for whom his countenance outdoes the sun, the moon, and the stars, the one who we began by believing that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then we admit, but I can't even seek you on my own. And he says, no, I'll change your wanter so you want to seek me. You see, we can have joy here. We can have happiness here, but hope will never be fulfilled until we see him face to face. It can always grow. Paul is pointing out that one way it grows is by feeding off its own fruit. Hope in the promises of God produces the fruit of joy and peace. But joy and peace in the promises of God are glorious evidences that we've been born again. And every evidence that we have been born again stirs up more hope. And more hope awakens more joy and more peace. And also more graces of God. And they continue abound. And all of a sudden it's like a snowball going down a hill. You see all these evidences that God really is at work in your life. He's changing you. You're hating sin in a way you didn't hate sin. And you're loving Jesus in a way you didn't love Jesus. And you're growing more and I would call us today to give yourselves to the promise of the word of God that he is the God of hope. And I would call you to pray to the God of hope that he will pour out into his Holy Spirit and enable us to see the truth and beauty and preciousness of Christ. That we will be filled with joy, filled with peace, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we might yet abound in hope. It was John who wrote, when we see him, we will be changed, right? And John, both in his epistles and in Revelation, he seems to have this longing to see Jesus face to face. Remember, John saw Jesus in the revelation of Jesus and recorded it on the Isle of Patmos. 
right? He saw him and could not wait to see him again. And he said over and over again, and I will not be the same. I'll be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. We're not going to be the same. What was it that made John long to be changed? Well, you know that John was the last living apostle. There were the 12 apostles. The first to die was Judas, who died soon after Jesus' death. And, and, and around the time of his resurrection, Judas uh, committed suicide. Uh, it was, he, was, he was tragically exposed as the one who turned on Jesus, right? So then the 11 remaining apostles, of those 11 remaining apostles, 10 of them were martyred for their faith, but one died of natural causes that we're aware of. It was John. He was the last one alive. We don't know what was going through his mind, but I have wondered, did he wonder, why am I the last? Why has everyone else gone on? Where's Peter? Where's Matthew? Right? What, what about the sons of thunder? I, I wonder, because James and John were inseparable. And James preceded John in his martyrdom. Well, you might recall that John, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him, according to Fox's Book of Martyrs, by boiling him alive in oil. And he survived. And when he survived that, they put him on the Isle of Patmos, hoping he would die of old age alone on that island. And it was there on the island that God gave John the revelation which we have. He was released from the Isle of Patmos. He came back to the mainland. But have you seen someone who's been in a vat of boiling oil and survived? Have you seen a burn victim? I remember as a youth pastor, we took our teenagers to King's Island for, for, to go to the roller coasters. I love the roller coasters. We enjoyed it. Now, I remember one particular trip I was... I was caught off guard because there was a young person who was being taken from ride to ride on a wheelchair. And you could see on the back of the wheelchair, it was a Shriners wheelchair. And, and it was the Shriners burn hospital that was bringing patients that had recovered enough to be able to go on the rides. And there was one young person who had burned in such a way that he, he didn't have eyebrows or eyelids. And he looked, it was challenging but he was smiling. He was getting on another roller coaster ride, right? But I did notice that my teenagers and me, we were looking, wow, look at that. John knew what it was to walk the streets of Jerusalem and have everyone point and look and say, look at that. Oh, oh, John knew what it was to stand out from the crowd. And yet the hope that he had was that one day I will see Jesus and I will be changed. I'll be different. Even though he saw all the lives changed, there was still something that he was hoping for, that he would see him face to face and he, would, he wouldn't be known for his burns. He wouldn't be known for his disfigurement. He would be known. And I, and I think about that because there on the Isle of Patmos, as he's being encouraged by Jesus himself, and then he said later in his epistles how he couldn't wait to see him face to face. Remember John, when he recorded in Revelation 21 and verse 5, Jesus comes right up next to him and says, Behold, I am making all things new. And John is standing beside Jesus, and John looks out. What was he looking at? What was Jesus making new in Revelation 21, 5? That Jesus told John, don't write down everything. Some of it will wait for then. I pictured it this way. That as Jesus is standing there saying, John, watch me make all things new. Look, there's Peter. Look, there's Matthew. They're not dead. They've been made new. You see, the promise is that God is making all things new. New. And so John had this perspective that the God of hope who gives us promises and speaks them over us and gives us his faith to believe them and then we have faith and we believe them and we have peace and joy and that is resulting in that we now have a hope. <sighs> Friends, that will give us the strength to not just endure but to soar.
I would hope that every graduate would hear that. That it is not about you and your efforts, but what Christ will do in you, through you, and renewing you, and even renewing this world. Even so, even so. Come quickly, Lord Jesus, let us pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for sending Jesus who was the word made flesh. Thank you that we have the promises that you are from everlasting to everlasting. May we cling to the true gospel that in Christ alone we have been made more than conquerors. We've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Father, I do pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you in a saving way, Maybe they've heard the gospel time and time again, but they've not yet been awakened to it from their slumber. I pray you would open their eyes, cause them to believe in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing from everlasting to everlasting. Oh God, before the mountains were brought forth, for days when spring and summer filled the earth, from everlasting you are God. We dwell beneath the stars in ancient skies, a thousand years are nothing in your sight from everlasting you are god and all our days are held within your hands your perfect love and favor have no end we rest within the of your plan everlasting God when tragedy collides when loss reminds us life is but a sigh from everlasting you Your perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within the wisdom of your plan, everlasting God. Oh God of light, our ways are to you, but by your grace you're making all things new, so satisfy us in our numbered days, establish every effort while we wait, from everlasting you. perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within the wisdom of your plan, everlasting, and all our days are held within your hands. Your perfect love and favor have no end. We rest within By his grace, he is making all things new. 
And he's given us the promises that it will happen. Let's rest in the God of hope. His promises. Let's rest in his self-identification as that. His payment of our sin through Christ. And let's leave with that hope that he is not just our hope, but our children's hope, our family's hope, our world, our country's hope. Now, unto him who is able to present you faultless before his throne, may he guard your hearts and minds in Christ, in the power of his Holy Spirit, in the reality of Jesus, risen and seated at the heavenly Father's hand. And all God's people say, Amen.